Welcome to my channel, Grand Columbia. If you're not familiar with the channel, I talk about all things Ecuador and Colombia. I lived in Ecuador for three years. I've been living in Colombia for about a year, um, not counting some time in ancient history when I lived here. I'm getting tons of questions about what's going on in Ecuador. Should I leave? Is it safe to go? So it's time we talked about that. Bear with me, I got 10 pages of notes, so I'm going to be looking down quite a bit at them, I'm sure. And I don't know if we're going to pick up a little noise, I'm sitting out here on the balcony just because it's just another beautiful day. So recently, Ecuador has just been in the news and everywhere. It's in worldwide news. It's been exploding. I'll throw up uh, some pictures here as we go along. And I'm seeing lots of comments. Honestly, I don't know a better way to put it, based on ignorance. A lot of people are talking, particularly on social media, about what's going on without spending so much as 10 minutes trying to actually research what's going on. They put all these comments out there. And it's, it's kind of crazy, and it's no wonder there's a lot of confused people. There's a lot of misinformation going on. First of all, we're going to get to all the factors that come into play here. Primata, first. I'm hearing the IMF loan is evil. And a lot of the reason that people are protesting is the IMF loan. There's some truth to the why they're protesting. We'll get to it. Second thing, the poor are going to get crushed by gas prices when they repeal the subsidy. We'll dig into that. Galapagos is going to be destroyed because they're leasing out or potentially going to lease out a naval refueling station. And last, the government is collapsing. So we need to dive into all of this. Let's start with a bit of history. A little disclaimer here, I'm going to generalize fair amount and I'm going to round off numbers if something is like 10.3 I just may call it 10 uh, I just don't want to get hung up on on those details but they're going to be essentially accurate Ecuador has a long history of instability as a matter of fact if you look since 1979 there's been a total of 12 presidents only three presidents since 1979 served for four years or more. That means nine presidents served for three years or less. Now the term is you get two terms, four years each. So you would think that those nine presidents would have at least served out a term? No, nine did not serve an entire term. As to the IMF, it's true that back in the mid 80s, Ecuador took out a big loan from the IMF, International Monetary Fund. The problem was, right after they took out the loan, the oil market crashed. And in those days, more than half of the income of Ecuador was from oil prices. Well, you know, it crashed. It was just a worldwide crash. In Ecuador, because so many people don't study, actually everywhere, but so many people don't study an issue. And it's easy for p politics for, to come into play and create its own narrative. But the loan was blamed for the economy that also took a crash. When half of your income disappears, of course, you know, it's going to have some effect. The truth is the IMF had nothing to do with the world market, the oil price, they didn't cause it to crash in order to pick on poor little Ecuador. That's not what happened. The IMF 
have been accused inside Ecuador for many, many years. And you have all kinds of conspiracy theories worldwide about the IMF. Some of it is accurate, a lot of it is not. And in order to borrow from them, you're going to have certain requirements, just like if you get a mortgage on a house, they may require that you pay off certain debt before they issue the mortgage. There are going to be some strings attached to it. Doesn't mean it's evil, that's what financial institutions do. Notice my Ecuador hat for this. So let's talk about the poor getting crushed by the loss of the subsidy. And what do I mean by that? Gasoline has been subsidized for many, many years in Ecuador. It was always supposed to be temporary. It was always a profit sharing scheme with the oil. More detail to come. Gasoline prices are just over a dollar forever in Ecuador. Yeah, dollar. Just over a dollar for a gallon of gasoline in Ecuador. Like a dollar seventeen, dollar nineteen, something like that. How are the poor gonna get crushed? Well, first of all, the poor in Ecuador they don't drive cars. Cars are very expensive in Ecuador. Getting a license is very expensive in Ecuador. Cars there are four or five times more expensive for the equivalent car here in, in Colombia, which is where I'm sitting right now. So, you know, the poor, they're not going to pull up to the pump and have to pay an extra $2 a gallon um, as it stands right now and, and suffer over it because they're not pulling up to the pump. So they say, well, you know, the, the bus companies, the fares are going to increase. Well, the fares are 25 cents. And yeah, they'll probably increase. But you know what? Before they pulled the gasoline subsidy, the fares were increasing anyway. You know, I went through some fare increases when I was living there. So, so yeah, the bus fees will probably go up some. But let's say they double. Let's say it goes to 50, 50 cents. Well, here in Colombia, there's just as many poor as there are in Ecuador, and the poor here ride buses, and the buses cost in, in the city, here in Armenia, for example, works out to about 65 cents, and somehow they manage. What it is, you have a subsidy that's picking up the tab on this for so many years, you get used to it, and it seems like a shock to your system. But if you take a step back, objectively look at it, it's not going to kill anybody. Bottom line is, you can't profit share when profit doesn't exist. More to come. I also saw, you know, the, the, the taxis are going to have a rate increase because they're paying more for gas. Yeah, that probably will happen. Although here in Colombia, where there are no gas subsidies and gasoline prices are somewhere between 3 and $4 a gallon, the taxi fares here are about the same, maybe even a little bit less than they are in, for example, Cuenca, Ecuador. But even if the fares go up again, the poor aren't using the taxis. Oh, there may be an occasional time when they have to get a taxi for one reason or the other, but it's, it's not transportation for the poor. But just think about this. If they were to keep this subsidy going, which is not supported by any income that comes directly out of the budget, and if they can't afford that, and the country goes bankrupt, and that's the danger, it's a, that's a serious consideration, more to come, which is better? pulling the gasoline subsidy or letting the country go bankrupt? Because seriously, those are the choices. And now let's get to the next one. The Galapagos are gonna be destroyed. Ecuador needs to raise money. Uh, they've been offered a contract to lease land in the Galapagos for an oil refuel refueling. But if you look at the history of this operation, there are no spills. I was said, well, there's going to be spills and it's going to destroy the Galapagos. Well, the storage tanks are, are double tanks. There, there's so much precaution. You, you don't hear about any kind of massive spill since the 70s because that was a wake-up call and they use technology to make sure that doesn't happen. There, there aren't spills around these operations. You know, I was in the Marine Corps uh, for six years and I and I spent some time on a naval vessel and watched 
how they would refill at shore and at sea. And um, they got it down. They know what they're doing. And this refueling is for military. So uh, they need the lease money, and they're not going to destroy the Galapagos. If they were, this president that they have in Ecuador, he is so socially conscious, he would never allow it. There's a lot of things he's not permitting that would bring in money, such as the, a certain amount of mining. So it's not like he's wholesale selling the country down the, the river. What he's trying to do is save the country every way he can, but still keep everything clean and pristine and intact. And the last one on that list is the government's collapsing. Well, given the history of Ecuador, I mean, there's always a possibility of that. If you moved to Ecuador and you didn't know that that is the track record of Ecuador, then you just didn't do your homework. There's always a danger of that. There is no history, long-term or short-term, of any real stability in Ecuador. They don't know how to do it because they've never done it. You know, I'm sitting here again, I, I could say, in a in country of Colombia, that's been a republic since the early 1800s. Actually, I should say a constitutional democratic republic. So they have several hundred years of experience with that kind of government. In Ecuador, they can't seem to go more than a few years without having some kind of coup or overthrow. Here's where the danger comes in. First of all, there's a lot of outside influence. You're seeing these riots. The first day, the riots that took place were pretty much organic. You saw people just kind of rising up and the argument was over the gas tax. They were peaceful and they had their say and it was over that day. But then the professionals came in. Now what a lot of people don't realize is a few days before all of this began, the ex-president Correa, oh and we're going to get to that rascal here shortly, but he went to Venezuela to meet with the president there, Maduro. And there is this little triumphant, well, it's more than three. You've got Cuba, you've got Venezuela, you've got Russia somewhat involved, you've got Bolivia. Bolivia and uh, Correa, they've always been best friends. And uh, Correa was always very close to Venezuela. They have a, they're all socialists, they have socialist uh, goals. They copy each other a lot uh, on how they operate in the government. So he went there and then all hell broke loose in Ecuador. I'm telling you, it's not a coincidence. Now, the way these riots that are going on uh, since that first day, they're saying, well, it's all indigenous people. Yeah, there's a lot of indigenous people and a lot of indigenous people have bought into the social, uh, socialist ideal. But Ecuador also has a history of using the indigenous to hide behind. I don't know another way to say it. Um, they use them like the United States will use for women or children. They'll say, oh, it's for the children. And, you know, as long as you put the children in the topic, then people don't want to attack you because then you appear to be attacking the children. Well, in Ecuador, they do the same thing with the indigenous. If you have anything to say, uh, then it's, it's reframed as though you're attacking the indigenous. I mean, it just happened. If you watch the news, Lasso, the guy who uh, ran for president last time and all the politics are coming out of the woodwork, you know, he had something to say about the indigenous and some of the things that were going on. And they're saying, well, it's ruined his chance to ever be president because, you know, he spoke so bad about the indigenous. Well, you know, if you take it out of contract, uh, context and twist it around, you could say that. But it's, it's part of the tool. It's, it's a historical weapon that they have used. Now, are the indigenous marching? Yeah, they are but it's embedded with basically troublemakers. And if you watch, if you watch these, you'll see the indigenous doing their thing and, and you know, having their say, but then you have all these other guys, you know, in their, uh, mostly in their mid twenties, a lot of them will be masked, um, fit guys, not dressed indigenous in the least. And they're going around and breaking windows and you know, they've, they've created a lot of damage. They've set a lot of fires. It, my personal opinion, based on the facts on the ground, is that Correa has set this up. 
that he has set up this violence and his fingerprints are all over it you know the meeting beforehand the people that are involved the the the, the things that are being said on the upside Moreno the current president has has noticed this and he's speaking out against it and you've got people starting to look at that so let's talk about Korea you know if he's if he's uh, behind a lot of this um, he, he's the making of this. He's the architect of this that goes back for years. Before he was elected president, Ecuador had come out of a currency crash and they were hungry for more rapid change. And he made so many promises that sounded so good. Some of these will sound familiar because you see them in other places. As a matter of fact, you're seeing them this year in the United States uh, for the election coming up. Here's some of his promises. Free education. Did it happen? No, it's actually quite expensive. New roads. Did it happen? Yeah. A lot of new roads got put up. That was a real plus. Public energy projects. You've got a number of dams that were built around Ecuador. Sounds good, right? Yeah, we'll get to that. New universities. Well, that sounds wonderful, too. He put up four of these new universities. One was an entire boondoggle that is a complete loss to the government. 100% subsidized by the government that was supposed to be the next Silicon Valley. It was an ego project that's south of Quito and it's been a disaster since day one. You got another one built in the Amazon that was supposed to be about eco studies. That one actually has a prayer of succeeding although it's it's still a, a deficit, it's still a, a burden. But he promised these new universities. He promised a new style of socialism. You know, you know, socialism has a bad name, particularly in countries where they've had some experience with it, but he promised a new type of socialism, democratic socialism. And here's some of the things that he did do to buy votes. He promised and succeeded before his second term to increase retirement pay about 400%. Yeah, 400%. Now, I'm not saying that the retirement pay before was good and the increase, well, it shouldn't have, I don't know. But an overnight increase of retirement people for your entire country of, of about 400% is pretty dramatic. Bought a lot of votes though. Keep in mind that the retirement system is part of the healthcare system, the IESS, it's Ecuador's social security system. They're together. And the IESS has been running uh, over $4 billion a year in the red. You, you're picking up on all these things that are losses to the country's budget. And what else did he do? He promised and did. National government workers all got double pay. Their pay increased by 100%. Bought a lot of votes. So what did he do in reality? Well, he bought a lot of votes. He consolidated power. He controlled the media. The free press was out the window. He shut newspaper down in Loja. He put the, uh, uh, the guy in Quito, he put him in, in prison for 30 days because he didn't like what he said. It was personally insulting. He nationalized the oil industry. Now the oil industry was partially nationalized for a number of years. He took it over 100%. That was in 2010. Basically, he stole. He stole the industry. Now, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the oil industry since, you know, this uh, initially began as gasoline subsidies. When he took over the industry, he took a page right out of the book of Venezuela. The people with the skill that were running the refineries, for example, they were out and he put in cronies. So he, he had these political allies, consolidation of power, and he put them in charge of various operations. No qualifications. Also, when he took it over, the world was shocked about it and all kinds of invest, investment money dried up. He promised people profit sharing you know he's taken over the oil so he's gonna you know promise the people something so he promised some profit sharing so he put into place what was called a windfall tax 
or a windfall profit tax. And in his initial days, the budget and his all these projects that I mentioned were going to be funded by oil profits. Now, prior to this happening, it was well over half a million barrels a day that Ecuador was producing. Now, on the world scale, that's not a lot, but that's what they were doing in Ecuador. And there were high oil prices at the time, so there was a lot being produced, the prices were very high, everybody seemed to feel flush and they seemed to think it was going to go forever. But then the oil prices crashed, as it does, it goes up and down, that's, you know, that's what all commodities do. And it crashed. You add to that the inefficiencies because of the skilled people that were sent away and you end up with a disaster going on. So what was over half a million, the oil production that took place after this debacle was a third of what it was before. They can't produce enough oil. As a matter of fact, there's limitations that are put on. They're a member of OPEC and they say, you know, you can't produce more than this. They can't even reach it. They can't even reach the, the amount set by OPEC. So there's no money in the oil and they can't produce it anyway. So if that was more than 50% of your budget before, what do you think that did with the national budget? There's basically, there was no money to sustain the country. So that all sounds pretty bad, right? Well, it gets worse. So then he's knee deep into all these projects and the money's drying up, so what does he do? Well, he can't go to the United States, he can't go to Europe, he can't, you know, he doesn't want to go back to the IMF, that's politically unpopular because of some, how it was misunderstood the time before. So he went to the Chinese. Now he was socialist and he intentionally cut ties with the United States and a lot of countries in Europe, basically the capitalist world or the free world or whatever you want to call it. He wanted to be on the side of Bolivia and Venezuela and Cuba, uh, Iran. He wanted to be in among that group and so he had no hesitation to kill trade deals and if he's going to get a loan the last place he's going to go to the United States so he went to China and he took out a loan and another loan and another loan and most of these loans were between two and four billion dollars now that may so not sound like a lot but if you look up the scale of Ecuador's budget you'll figure out real quick that's a lot that's that's a huge amount it's a small country uh, the population is half of that of Colombia. It's the, this country is the size of Colorado. So it's, you know, billions is like trillions for other countries. It's, it's, a, it's a large amount. So he kept taking out these loans from the Chinese to basically deceive the country. Everything was doing well. That his, his brilliant economic policies that were going to provide all of this infrastructure and wealth to the country. He ended up taking out about 54 billion dollars in loans from the Chinese, but to make matters worse, he lied about it. He did, he, what he publicly reported in the loans was about a third of what he actually took out. So when the elections were coming around, people didn't have any concept of how bad he left the country of Ecuador financially. So you had refinery, you've got refinery in Esmeraldas with a pipeline that comes up through Quito, from the Amazon through Quito, right to Esmeraldas, you got that refinery. You have uh, an operation in La Libertad. And you've also got one in a place called Shushu Findi. I have no idea where that is and I didn't bother looking on the map. But you've got, you know, three refinery operations but it's so problematic, it's so inefficient, they're almost non-functioning. The oil is sent to other countries to get refined and then it comes back. So now you're taking your own oil but you're, you're price adding to it so it returns and it's way more expensive than if they had just kept it in country and refined it. But again, remember, they ruined that industry and they just don't have the capability anymore. They can barely produce oil. So what do you have left after these um, loans to China? Well, there were deals to do mining for the Chinese to, to, for China to have the rights to mining. 
the Social Security system is bankrupt. It, it's in the hole over $4 billion a year. The health system and the retirement system, it, it's just got to you know, take money from somewhere to pay for it. The subsidies are simply unaffordable. They're not profit sharing anymore. They are a dead loss. So the new president comes along. Now, his name is Lennon, Lennon Moreno. Lennon, it's not a coincidence. He's a lifelong socialist. He lived and breathed being socialist. He was supposed to be the caretaker of the consolidated power that Korea put into place so that Korea could ultimately pull the strings and possibly return as the returning hero. His, he had already run his two terms. Did that work out? Well, that, it didn't work out because what nobody seemed to figure is it turns out this guy, Lennon Moreno, has a conscience. He may be ideologically, you know, a certain way, but he's a pragmatist. He got into office and he saw the, firsthand the economic state of Ecuador. Right after his election, words started coming out. And I thought very intelligent, rather than just proclaim that certain things occurred, he had international accountants come in from various places and do a forensic accounting of the financial situation of Ecuador. And it was a nightmare. He knew a long time ago, shortly after he became president, that he was faced with a mounting disaster. During this, he uncovered a lot of crimes by Korea and his people. Uh, it, they're still being uncovered. Uh, there's court cases going on right now. Of course, if Korea can undermine the government, flip a coup, get somebody that he is more in control of in power, then all of this can go away. So while this Lennon Moreno is discovering all of this and he's trying to be pragmatic and he's trying to save Ecuador from bankruptcy and collapse, he's being treated like a traitor. He's being treated like the enemy. Uh, he did betray his own political party because he's not a corrupt person apparently. He didn't want any part of the corruption. He didn't know the corruption was going on. He couldn't have because of the way it's exposed had he been part of it, he would have exposed himself. No, this was, uh, this was an honest man that got in, saw what was going on, he's trying to fix it. He's been fighting China over the, the mine work that uh, Korea promised as some payoff. You know, he was selling off you know, parts of Ecuador in order to pay for all this that he got to prop himself up and to buy votes and all of the projects. But Moreno stood up to the Chinese when they came in to claim their mines. You know, they just came in, they sent mining crews in. And uh, the people were pretty outraged, you know, because some of the, well, like the mining around uh, Cuenca, it's right there uh, at, the, at the source of the water supply. And the way the Chinese do mining, it's very toxic. I mean, it would have been a, it would have been a, a disaster. So. You know, he, he put a stop on all this, the mining in the Amazon, all the things that were set up before he got into office, he, he held them off. He needs cash to stabilize Ecuador. So what he did was he basically ended financial ties with China, except for the existing ones that he had to continue with. He rebuilt relations between the United States. I mean, it's the biggest trading partner in the world. In other words, it's the biggest market for you. You don't just put your thumb in your eye. You want a piece of that market. He negotiated that refueling lease. He created a no tax, no tax to the people, no cost to the people of Ecuador. He created a lease to a private company to come in near Guayaquil and build a deep water port. Uh, there's only a couple of these in the world, and that port would become an, a, a transport point for all of South America. So rather than burden the people with a government project, the people will just receive lease money into the budget. And all the risk and the cost is being borne out by a private company. If it went under, Ecuador just claims whatever is there. There's, there's no loss. Pretty smart. It's the way, uh, the way Australia does a lot of things. He's developed a lot more export agreements. 
and he's dropped some taxes some of the import taxes uh, he's dropped them but he still needs more cash this is a huge deficit he went to the IMF rather than I mean you go to China or you go to the IMF well we tried the China and they wanted to basically rape and pillage the country over it IMF isn't going to do that so he went to the IMF and he's he's getting or got they're in process of about ten billion dollars just a touch more they're requiring that he ends the gas subsidy it's a, it's a huge drain and there's no money for it and I don't think they want to give a loan that's just going to go into a gas subsidy and then disappear I mean then it, then what what do you do after that you still have the same debt so the, that's one of the stipulations and they're also stipulating that he dropped the import tax the import taxes are crazy there and so uh, from what I understand on computers cell phones on a lot of things that historically have been very expensive dropping completely those those taxes and what that does is it opens the door so that Ecuador can export more because the more they put those taxes on the less other countries want to trade with you but you're screwing them they don't want to reward you and you have to you know keep in mind you know if you want to sell sell shrimp and bananas and chocolate products that Ecuador exports for a lot of money if you're really upsetting a lot of those trading partners right next door in Colombia guess what they they have their own shrimp industry and they they have lots of bananas and they have lots of coffee best coffee in the world so if you want to compete you can't put your thumb in people's eye you've got to do things to get along it's a two-way street and so they required that but he was already headed in that direction anyway because he was in that direction the IMF was actually willing to give a loan to Ecuador because if these things take place, Ecuador can get back on its feet, but it's going to be tough. So what is the way out? Well, first they've got to fight off what amounts to a political coup attempt. Fortunately for Moreno, or Moreno, the coup attempt from the riots is resulting in a lot of damage. And that may sound a little warped, but the thing is, all of that damage is taking place is kind of reversing public opinion. And so instead of a complete pile on, on him, they're beginning to see that maybe this anger should be going in a different direction. There are forces at work that ultimately, for the sake of power, could destroy Ecuador. People need to wake up to that. Continue exposing Correa's involvement in all of this. He needs to get this out to the public. He needs to show the evidence, the proof. It's A lot of it is there. Uh, they need to keep digging. People need to be educated in Ecuador as to the real situation and what's going on. He needs to continue to diversify income. More trade deals, new trade deals. Working with other countries instead of letting politics come into play. You don't, you don't hate somebody just because they're capitalists if they can bring you a contract that's going to put a lot of people to work. Another item, and these unfunded subsidies. The gasoline subsidy is the one everybody's talking about. It's not the only subsidy. It just happens to be, I think, I believe it's the largest. You can't give what you don't have. Probably going to have to reverse some of those vote-getting uh, projects that Korea had, you know, the 400% on the retirement that's bankrupting the system. It is bankrupt. The money is coming from other, other places in Ecuador in order to shore it up. So if you want to have a retirement system and a healthcare system, you know, it needs to be self-sustaining. And as far as, you know, vote getting, doubling the pay of government workers, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how you go about that without having a massive revolt when you've had a number of years with people getting double the pay, how do you half their pay? I don't know that you can do that, but there are probably some things that they could cut back on. They need to sell some of these government projects. Yeah, that means privatize. I mean, first of all, the government has no expertise in these things. Let's, for example, let's look at the dams, the hydroelectric projects that the Chinese put up using all Chinese labor. People said, well, you know, the Ecuadorians got a lot of jobs. No, they didn't. Chinese brought all their own labor. Uh, it was, there was no, 
benefit from that for Ecuador, which um, seemed almost criminal to me when it was going on. I went and actually visited one of these um, dam projects south of Cuenca. So not only the government doesn't have the expertise to run and operate these things, but there's a cost to rebuild. For example, the one uh, closer to Quito, it's already falling apart. The concrete has massive cracks in it. There is a lot of rework that's going to have to take place at this dam. And then, of course, you've got to maintain the dams, you've got to operate them. Not only no expertise, but it's going to cost money to do that. They just need to sell or lease these projects out to private companies that know what they're doing, that know how to do this efficiently. And if they buy or if they lease these, it's because they know how they're going to make a profit with it. You can tie in certain things. You can, you, you know, you can guarantee certain levels. That, um, the people of Ecuador, uh, they won't have to pay exorbitant amounts for electric. This electricity can be sold to neighboring countries, and that's where they can pick up their money. So they could be creative with this. So other projects like the Silicon Valley, that's just a dead loss to the country. It was such a bad idea. You know, sell it to private investors that maybe can do something else with it. The one in the Amazon actually has potential. If they put that in private hands, lease it or sell it, that could ultimately be what it was intended to be, these eco-studies. Uh, it's just, why should the people of Ecuador support this? Why should they pay out of their own pocket? for this when it could be turned over to somebody else. Okay, another thing is lift all of these damn taxes, all of these import-export taxes. I've already mentioned, you know, reasons why it's it's a nightmare in Ecuador. Things cost so much money. It's, it's, uh, this is not good for the people. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you remove the gas subsidy, but you also remove these taxes, you're going to find a lot of things become affordable for people of Ecuador that have not been affordable. So, you know, it's a huge burden on Ecuador, the people of Ecuador. It also closes trade doors, which they need wide open right now. They need income. On my list, I've got number six. Sell or lease the oil refineries. Go back to oil companies that know what they're doing operating these. They've shown over the last decade that almost a decade, Ecuador has no clue on how to operate these. They can't run at minimum efficiencies. When the oil companies ran them, they ran, as I mentioned, 300% more efficient than they're running now. Put it back in their hands. If you lease these or sell with profit sharing, you can actually turn this into an income source instead of a constant loss. You might even be able to negotiate in some of the Chinese contract loan money into the uh, sale or leasing of these operations. Number seven, change these labor laws. It was a great idea. It was intended to, you know, help people and give labor protections. It was another way to buy votes. But it sounded real good and on, on first blush when you hear it, it sounds real nice. But you have to remember that all of this, everything has a cost. For example, for employers, one year salary became 14 months salary. There's two months of the year where they have to pay two months in that month rather than the regular monthly pay. If somebody is fired, you have to give them a severance. Now, you could hire an example. You could hire somebody to clean your house, and they're working, you know, basically full-time or close to full-time. And after a month, you find out they've been stealing from you, and so you fire them. Next thing you know, you've got to go pay $2,000 to them. Doesn't matter if they were stealing. Doesn't matter if you could prove they were stealing. The way the law is, you still got to pay them. You have to pay for their IESS, or a hefty portion of it. You have to pay for the Social Security system. Not necessarily the, the worst thing, but it's still another thing that was put in there. You know, maybe they could keep some or all of that. But what was the result? The result of this was massive job losses, because who was paying for all this? The businesses were. Businesses couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford this stuff. So jobs were lost. Again, one example, and I'll use the maid again because it's, a, it's the most notorious. 
there was a thriving industry in Ecuador of maid service. And people made their life around that. My good friend Maria, if you remember some videos going back two, three, almost four years ago, I spent a lot of time with Maria for about a year traveling around looking at things and great conversations about Ecuador and how it worked. Her mother was a professional maid and she grew up with her mother, it was just the two of them, living in maid's quarters. Her mother worked, they had a place to stay and for a lot of years they had a good life living like that because that's the way it was. People who were middle class, upper middle class or wealthy would hire maids, give them a job, give them a place to stay, uh, feed them. It, it, it worked out good for everybody. I asked her how her life was then. She said it was very good. They had a good life. They didn't have to struggle and the government wasn't doing any subsidies. Well after the labor laws, those all went to the wayside. Uh, it, it, it became very expensive to have them. It became risky to have them. So because it was such a culture, you'll see so many houses and apartments built back before the change of the law that have maid quarters as part of it. I mean, it was a standard feature for every house that was middle class or more to have maid quarters. Now they're all empty. Now they're just extra places. They're, you know, mother-in-law apartments or whatever because the industry vanished. About the only maid service anymore is there's a few in businesses that will have maids, but you've mostly got all kinds of people working under the table. So they're not reaping those benefits anyway, just decimated an industry. And that's just one example. You can look at this for industry after industry. It had a huge negative impact. So what's gonna happen? You've got the pragmatist, Lena Moreno, who is trying to save Ecuador financially, trying to save it, being hammered left and right. Even all these gringos are chiming in and, and throwing out all these conspiracy theories and they hate him because as soon as you mention Galapagos, well, if he's leasing something there, he's the devil incarnate. It doesn't matter how safe and pristine the operation will be. So, oh, he wants to change his labor laws. He, you know, he hates the people he's sold out. and. You know, so you've got all kinds of gringos piling on without actually looking what the results of these laws were. Things need to be done. Because here's the thing, that list I went over, if those aren't done, Ecuador is bankrupt. There will no, be no functioning government. How are you going to like it then? This is a turning point. Something is going to have to give. So is it going to be the pragmatist or is it going to be the socialist? Who's going to win out in this battle? Is it going to be survival of Ecuador or is it going to be a power grab? Given the history of Ecuador's instability, it's pretty hard to say. But that's how we got here, folks. That's what it's about. You can nitpick here or there, but if you go back and research, you're going to find that basically what everything I've told you is valid. So let me ask you, what would you do? See you next video.